Right now, I would like to can, uh, welcome Ambassador Abukra Asman Abukrabale. As I said earlier, uh, is the ambassador, Somali ambassador to, Uni to the United Nations and also the acting ambassador to the United States here in Washington, D.C. Ambassador Abukrabale, please welcome. And like I said earlier, fly us into a prosperity and harmony. Uh, thanks, Dr. Saadia, and good evening, everybody. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just a um, correction, a little bit correction. Um, I'm the permanent representative of the ambassador of Somalia to the United Nations, uh, but uh, the embassy here, uh, the, we have a chartered affair, uh, Roon Korshel, but I am, as an as adult, uh, someone who has a lot of experience, I was asked just to oversee but she is the charge of the affair. Just make that correction uh, to to everybody. Um, it's a, it's a really great pleasure to come back uh, to a city that I used to live uh, when I was uh, a young man, and I think I've seen some faces uh, in the early 80s that also uh, was still here, and I think I miss this city, uh, even though um, uh, later I became a Midwestern. Uh, and stayed in uh, many states in the Midwest. Um, dear esteemed guests, I just want to acknowledge uh, the guests in the house, um, and I think uh, everyone who came tonight, I think, is uh, 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 as, uh, deserves our uh, special welcome. Because this diaspora meeting is really very critical, and for the Somali government, especially. Uh, the government led by President Muhammad Abdullah Formajo and Prime Minister Ali Hassan, Hassan Ali Khayre. And that shows uh, because of the participation of an important uh, minister in the government to send, to come and join us today, Minister Bailey, and also uh, a young and dynamic uh, uh, a cabinet member, uh, the, uh, the Deputy Minister of Minister of Petroleum and Mineral Resources, uh, uh, Hilal, which is uh, someone I also know him for quite some time. And um, having said that, I also want to um, um, reiterate the importance of this meeting, because since we have uh, people who have uh, a lot of experience in the field of um, economic development and um, engaging the diaspora, like our uh, a friend and former minister, um, um, Halane, and I see many faces that, uh, that I have, I know that work for many international financial institutions uh, that are Somalis, that have in their heart for the uh, rebuilding of the Somali economy. Uh, people work for the IMF, uh, World Bank, are also represented here. But more importantly, Somalis are uh, known for entrepreneurship uh, skills. And that, uh, can be attested if you go and see where the Somali um, uh, diaspora communities are concentrated, whether it's uh, in Minneapolis, in Columbus, Ohio, uh, Seattle, if you go to Boston, Massachusetts, even see the uh, uh, DC uh, metropolitan areas like uh, in Maryland and, and Virginia and Atlanta, everywhere you go you see uh, a thriving businesses run by Somalis of all ages. And, uh, and I think I have to also uh, mention this, the engine of the Somali economy, whether it's in, in, in inside the Somalia or outside, uh, that can be also uh, uh, collaborated by uh, the two, uh, the current Minister of Finance and former Minister of Finance is the backbone of the Somali economy since the collapse of the regime of 1990, was our uh, female, our girls, our mothers, our sisters. And without them, I don't believe uh, we, will, we will be where we are today. So we have to give uh, a round of applause. Uh, again, it's, it's a great pleasure for me um, to attend and to welcome you on this, this second annual Somali Diaspora Summit. 
it's a great honor to represent the Somali government in this event, at least on opening. And I won't be long um, because of the, uh, I know tomorrow is going to be a very, very long day and very critical. So I'm thinking since uh, we're already starting late start on this, I want you to have all rest, a good rest, so you can be prepared for tomorrow's uh, uh, really uh, the big event. Tonight is just the, uh, and the welcoming you. As we cultivate uh, our bilateral ties through great understanding and appreciation for the nation you call home, at uh, Somalia, uh, we host this event to also encourage you to engage in the development efforts of our beloved homeland, uh, Somalia. But again, again, I have to reiterate the importance of the private sector. Um, um, I remember those of us of my age or, or a little bit older, uh, we remember when Somalia chose to the socialism, it did not work really the way it was supposed to because it contradicts the, the nature of the Somali individual, which is the independence and, 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 and thinking of entrepreneurship ideas and having that kind of things. I remember once uh, I had um, a discussion um, while I was working in Somalia, uh, someone from the United States, an American, and, um, and we were discussing the, um, the, the issues on, on Somalia at the time. It was, it was a very critical time in 2010. And he mentioned something that uh, probably a uh, few of us can remember. Uh, there was a book he referred to me written by a, a, a former Peace Corps that worked in Somalia in the late 1960s. And he wrote a book in 1982. Uh, and the book he was discussing on his experience while working in Somalia. And amazing thing that he made, it, and, and I just want to uh, uh, also uh, give some uh, heads up. I know uh, Ambassador Akira will be coming, a Pan-Africanist will be coming here. Probably she will uh, find this uh, uh, statement to at least respond to this. And he said the Somalis are closest in kin that I can think of. His book, the book was 1982. I forgot the title, but I can search, and I think I have it at home. Uh, because once he mentioned, I bought the book through, through the, uh, the Amazon. And he says the Somalis in, in, in values, in culturally, the way they think and the way they do, the closest in kin, he said, was Texans. And the amazing thing he said was the three things they have in common, the Texans and the Somalis. And the first one is they hate authority. <laughs> the Somalis don't like to be, you know, someone bossy, coming and telling them what to do. So it shows you because of that nature that we have a, a independent thinking and that, that has helped thrive in, in the business. And the second thing he said, the Somalis guy and, and Texans are always ready to fight. He said the Somali guy, he either has a gun, he either has a gun, and, or if he doesn't have a gun, he have a knife, always. If he doesn't have a knife, he carries a, a cane. So that shows you he's always ready to fight. <laughs> and he said the only difference in Texan and Somali, he said at the time, Somalis don't have a lot of guns, but Texas have, uh, Texans have a lot of guns, and the person who have the most guns become the sheriff of the town. But Somalis don't have that authority, so everybody is his own boss. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think uh, 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 um, this is something that uh, we have to reflect, because entrepreneurship is in our blood. And I'm really glad to see a lot of faces of uh, Somali businesses, uh, came all the way, some of them came all the way from, from Somalia, and some came from Ohio, some came from Boston. I think it gives me more uh, um, uh, encouragement that Somalis are now finally ready to rebuild their own country and using their own skills and their own resources. But tomorrow will be a big day, and then I will not be uh, 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 for this thing. Um, so, uh, 
Uh, it, again, it's, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to be here. Um, I feel fun. I feel fun to come here because I'm going to meet agriculture side of the Somalis. We're going to Somalis are orators, so uh, From where I came, we're not orators. I came from Johar. <laughs> we are doers. <laughs> so uh, I will be short and thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome tonight. When I saw that she's in the program, I was really excited. And I shared that uh, invitation that I was sent to my daughter. Um, and she said, can I come with you? And I said, maybe. And, uh, and I finally offered her and said, you can come with me. But she has, uh, she has to take her two younger daughters, uh, or two younger daughters of mine, her sisters to another program she's already uh, presented. But it's a great pleasure for me. And believe me, you are uh, um, uh, um, um, our icon, our pan-Africanist voice. Uh, in, in the diaspora and inside Somalia and inside Africa in general. Uh, there was a video that was uh, recorded uh, uh, at a luncheon that she participated. Believe me, it was circulated like in everywhere. I'm a member of uh, um, uh, what's called uh, WhatsApp group, because nowadays WhatsApp is, is everything. So WhatsApp group for the PRs, the permanent representatives of, of every country in the United Nations. And it was like circulating in the African group, circulating in the OIC group, it was circulating in the Arab League, it was circulating in the, the whole group. So it was like a, a, a something that gives every African person at least a hope that we ha still have a leader like the Ambassador Akira. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you uh, to the second annual Somali Diaspora Forum. Um, Welcome, Ambassador. Good evening, my brothers and sisters. To the excellencies who have traveled thousands of miles to come and join us today. We really appreciate you truly for doing what you have done and blessing us <clears throat> with your presence today. The two, uh, the current Minister of Finance, the former Minister of Finance, his deputy, my sister, the Chagé for, uh, for our, our embassy here, my brother, the um, permanent representative in, uh, at the United Nations, uh, my wonderful brothers and sisters, uh, from all over, the, uh, all over the country and all over uh, Africa. It is indeed a great and wonderful evening to address you today. I bring you greetings from your 55 African heads of states and of course your 1.27 billion brothers and sisters on the continent. <laughs> also don't forget your other 400 brothers and sisters members of the African diaspora living outside our Africa. My name is Arikana Chiyombori. In my previous life, I was a medical doctor minding my own business. Um, getting ready to wind down, I was supposed to be, uh, my husband and I, we're both my husband, Sabko, I always forget him. He is uh, he's sitting over there. He's an old shoe, he's very comfortable, so I forget him. Uh, but <laughs> we were getting ready to be cruise doctors, uh, particularly, you know, specifically the Queen Mary. Uh, there's a Queen Mary ship that does a 365-day uh, cruise around the world, and our plan was to, there's a hope on the areas around the world that you can jump in and, and be a doctor for, you know, a month or so, and then get off and join again until you con complete the, uh, the full uh, world tour. That was my plan. That was our plan until this phone call comes. And it was Madame Zuma suggesting that I should be an ambassador. I said, are you kidding me? I've been a doctor for 30 years. What are you talking about? What do I know about diplomacy? I really thought she was kidding me. And then she calls again, and she calls again. And by six months, she said, listen, if you don't take this position, 
It's going to stay open as long as she was the chairman of the African Union. And then my husband chimes in and says, honey, you're being given an opportunity to do something about what is wrong with our Africa. And if you don't take this opportunity, I don't ever want to hear you complain about what is wrong with our Africa. On that note, I said, no pressure. The plan was to come here just for six months, tops. I wanted to be able to look at my husband and say, honey, you see, I tried. I just couldn't do it. I wanted to be able to look at Madam Zuma and say, see, Your Excellency, I did the best I could. Because really, if you think about it, all I have done is get up every morning <clears throat> and care for humanity. As a doctor, every day you are listening to other people's problems and you're trying to provide solutions. How do you make that transition from being a medical doctor to being a diplomat? Absolutely no clue. And when I tell you I was totally clueless, I am not exaggerating. I came to Washington with a clean slate, no plans of staying. I stayed in a hotel for five months because I knew, come six months, I'm out of here. But as I was coming to the end of the uh, fifth month, one thing became really apparent. I think for the first time in my life, I was I loved the opportunity to just really sit back and begin to look around and begin to understand the world around me. But more importantly, what became very apparent and repeatedly became a nagging situation in my life every day was the status of us black people. I just simply I knew we were disrespected, but I just didn't realize the extent to which we were disrespected and quite often disregarded. Um, it was that singularly that got me to say, maybe I should just hang around a little bit longer. Hang around and begin to understand why we black people are the most disrespected race on earth. No matter where you encounter us, anywhere on earth, I wondered if there was a memo that somehow went out, because this memo didn't miss anybody. It didn't miss any part of the world. No matter where you go, I think this memo said, if you're not black and you encounter a black person, it's okay to disrespect them. It doesn't matter which part of the world you go to. The question then keeps coming back to say, but what have we done to the world as black people? And then history tells us that we are the origin of humanity as Africa. History also tells us that we happen to be the inheritors of one of the richest continent on earth. We happen to be the go-to place for everything the world needs today and will need forever. When you put the two together, there is no reason why we shouldn't be the most revered race on earth. And the more I, did, I dug deeper and began to try to understand and, and really feel that passion to say, I have grandkids, can I truly leave this world the way it is? for us black people? And the answer repeatedly was no, absolutely not. So I had to understand what is it about us as black people? Why are we where we are? Why are our, are our circumstances the way they are in the world? I found myself going back to the Berlin Conference when it comes to Africa. For those of you who haven't looked up the Berlin Conference, I urge you to do so. Berlin, just like the city in Germany. Berlin Conference, when our colonizers realized that they were getting ready to kill each other, fighting over how to steal from Africa, the then Chancellor of Germany, Bismarck, he called all the other colonizers to say, listen, we're going into Africa haphazardly. Everybody's stealing and taking whatever they want. We're getting ready to fight each other. Why don't we meet in Berlin? Let's organize ourselves so we can effectively steal from these monkeys, referring to the Africans. 
So they met in Berlin to organize themselves so they can effectively loot from the Africans. Now that was Britain, France, Germany, Portugal, Italy, Belgium, Portuguese, I think I mentioned Portuguese. They, 14 countries, they met to organize themselves so they can see to it that Africa and her children are forever defeated and dominated. Let's get this clear and allow me to underscore that. They met in Berlin to see to it that Africa and her children are forever defeated and dominated and that was 135 years ago. The strategy was to break up Africa. The more powerful a kingdom was, keep in mind prior to 1884, the countries that we know as African countries, they did not exist. We were powerful kingdoms with well-established educational and religious systems. They sought out to destroy all that, make us forget all the inventions, advances that we had, that they did not have. And they took everything that we had in artifacts that took, they took back home to their countries. To this day, they're still refusing to give us back our artifacts. They took what we had because we were much more advanced than they were, but they will not accept that fact. So the more powerful a kingdom was, the more countries that came out of it. I often use an example of driving from Zambia, you are speaking English. Pretty soon you are in Angola, you are speaking Portuguese. Very soon you are in DRC, you are speaking French. You are in, you are in Equatorial Guinea, you are speaking Spanish. You are in Southern uh, Cameroon, you are speaking uh, English. You are in Northern Cameroon, you are speaking French. And very soon you are in Nigeria, you are speaking English. All designed for maximum destruction. A people who used to be one, give it a generation or two, they will never know that they were related. Look at the East Horn of Africa. I can tell the difference between all of you. People from Djibouti, from Eritrea, from Ethiopia, Somalia. We're all the same people. But we were meant to believe. I was just sitting next to my brother who said, even one tribe, was divided into five groups, all by design, to inflict maximal destruction of a people. In addition to breaking us up, they also set in motion the rule of divide and conquer, made us believe that everything African was bad and undesirable, and that's also where they solidified being white and being black. Have you ever wondered why the color black is associated with everything undesirable? If I were to ask all of you right now, what color is the devil? 100% of you, black. Who has seen the devil? <laughs> but we were told the devil is black. Everything evil, the villain in movies is black. Bank robbers, they wear black masks. I've never seen a bank robber with a white mask. <laughs> Even the, the devil's food cake is black. But the angel's food cake is white. The angels are white. Even though nobody has ever seen an angel. <laughs> so they take all these descriptions. White is associated with everything beautiful and desirable, even though I've never seen a white person. We were just told they're white, and that they're perfect, and they're pure. Take it. And then you all are black, you're evil, you're undesirable, take it. And what did we do? Yes, master. So we are mothers. Black mothers, we are raising our children in our homes, telling them, you are black and you are beautiful. But the reality is, when they step foot outside their home, they are nothing but immense, 
in an ocean of negativity. A world that tells them that that which you represent as a black person is evil, is bad, and undesirable. How do we get out of that? How do you raise a child in such a world? And none of us has ever challenged it. We simply accept it as fact. Why is that? The most intelligent, hardworking people I know were spoon fed nothing but lies about who we are, and we just take it. 135 years ago, and the beat goes on. Nothing has changed. The reason Africa cannot trade with itself, the reason intra African trade is sitting at 18%. It's because Berlin Conference makes it impossible for countries that are next door to each other to trade. A friend of mine once showed me a picture, a photograph. There were a group of women on one side selling their vegetables and tomatoes, and on the other side, another group doing the same thing. I said, Ambassador, what do you see? I said, I see a road. He said, no, that's a border. When the women on this side of the street run out of tomatoes, the customers, on this side cannot cross over and buy the tomatoes that they can look at. Why? They need a visa. Thanks to Berlin Conference. Have you tried to cross the border and see how long it will take you to drive from Togo to, to Nigeria? What you have to go through through the borders? Have you tried to, take, to get three visas to go and visit three African countries? You send your visa to Nigeria. It might take you three to four weeks to get it back. Then you send your passport back to Kenya. It might take you another two, three weeks to get it back. Then you send your passport to Botswana. It might take you another two, three weeks to come back. By the time you get your passport from Botswana, your visa for Nigeria is expired. So what do you do? I'm going to France. Forget Africa. Berlin Conference. For those who believe that Berlin Conference is a thing of the past, my brothers and sisters, Berlin Conference is alive and well. Which is why I'm so proud of President Abiy of Ethiopia. Not even a month or two in, in office, he picks up the phone. He calls the president of Eritrea, my brother, why are we fighting? Come home for dinner. A 30 year old war was over. That's what I'm talking about. That's what we can do when we understand who we are and how we got here. When we realize that we're fighting somebody else's war, not ours. When we realize that we are in autopilot of nothing but sheer stupidity as Africans. Because we refuse to understand our issues for who, what they are. Whose war is it? Why are we where we are? Let's understand our circumstances. Let's understand our history. Let's understand the real undercurrent that is behind Africa that we know today. Because the truth of the matter is, what we are made to believe as fact is a mirage. We are seeing our Africa with lenses that are clouded. We must understand that the bigger forces behind our Africa are responsible for why we are on autopilot, why we are in a sleeping slumber. Because all of you know very well that a lot of what is happening on the continent, we can stop it. But why is it so difficult for us to do so? Why can't we get along? Even when I look at our circumstances as black people in this country, when you ask for the voices of the Indian diaspora, loud and clear. The Chinese, the Irish. I once attended a fundraising event for the Irish diaspora in this country. 
of 8,000 people. The speakers were members of, uh, of the of Congress. They were from the State Department. They were members of think tanks in this town. Two, three generations removed from Ireland. Some have never been to Ireland, but they were proud Irish diaspora. Why? Because they understand the importance of being connected to their anchor. Everyone in this country, with the exception of the American Indians, they have their primary anchor outside the United States, and they hold on tight to their anchor. It's only us black people. We're too busy denying our Africa. We're too busy denying our anchor, which is why we're like palm trees. The wind blows this way, here we go. The wind blows that way, here we go. We're like a ship with all sails but no anchor. Whether we like it or not, Africa is home. Plain and simple. You see, a disrespected Africa equates to a disrespected African diaspora. Until Africa is respected, until Africa goes back to her old glory, we will forever be in the wilderness. We will forever be disrespected as a race. So it is absolutely important that we understand that a strong, prosperous Africa is how we gain back our respect, not only for our sake, but for the sake of our children and generations to come. Now, 1963, our Pan-African leaders realizing that Berlin Conference left us on a losing lane and that the invitation of Emperor Haile Selassie. They met in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, precisely to undo the damage done by the Berlin Conference. Sadly, when they went to Addis Ababa, they were divided. There was the Casablanca group who said, Africa for the Africans, African Union now. They also stated that you are not African because you were born in Africa, but rather you are African because Africa is born in you. You got to understand. You see, being an African is a spirit. When you have that African spirit, you know it. When you walk around and meet somebody who has Africa born in them, you know it. It is that spirit that each and every one of us must make sure that it stays alive and well among us. Because it is that singularly the spirit that's going to take us where Africa needs to be on the world stage. The other group were the nationalists. Sadly, they were the majority. They said, let's go slow. Let's not rush into this integration. Well, guess what? We often say, when the Casablanca group lost, Casablanca group was Ghana, Guinea, Mali, Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. When the Casablanca group lost in 1963, Africa lost. But all is not lost, my brothers and sisters. Fast forward 55 years later, our Pan-African leaders, finally, March of last year, they signed what we are now calling the African Continental Free Trade Area, where they said Africa must speak with one voice, Africa must go to the world stage as Africa, because as Africa, we are a heavyweight. As Somalia, we are not even a heavyweight, not even a middleweight, not even a lightweight. We are a wannabe boxer who's being thrown in the box, heavyweight boxing ring every day. How do you put Somalia in the same boxing ring with China? They said, this is insanity of the highest order. It must come to an end. It may have taken us 55 years, but better late than never. So March last year, we signed the African Continental Free Trade Area. The naysayers were saying, it's never going to happen. You see, these ratifications, because you see, we needed this many heads of states to sign. So far, we have 54. Actually, Eritrea was the last one. I believe they've sign up, finally signed. We only needed 22 countries to ratify. Ratification meant from Addis Ababa, they go back home. They put this decision through the parliament. The parliament approves it, and they've deposited the ratification papers to the African Union. 
the nurses were saying it's never going to happen. This African continent of free trade area is going to be a piece of paper in a drawer somewhere. Africans can never come together in any meaningful way. So don't even worry about this CFTA. It's never going to happen. True. Because ratifications in general, they take long. An average of five years to get a ratification. Well, guess what, my brothers and sisters? Exactly 13 months, which was April this year, the 22nd ratification was deposited to the African Union. Hallelujah. <laughs> July 7th this year, the heads of states officially launched the African Continental Free Trade Area. 12 months from July this year, our Africa is going to begin to trade as Africa, the heavyweight. I'm calling it a 56-year-old pregnancy. <laughs> the baby is finally born. But just to go, it goes to show you how much we are fast asleep. First, the last ratification was, the 22nd ratification was deposited in April. Exactly 30 days from that day, the CFTA was in force. I was in Addis Ababa, and I stayed until midnight. I wanted to see the fanfare of Africa celebrating this amazing achievement of 700 years. And I'm saying 700 years is because the first colonizers who were the Portuguese came to Africa 700 years ago. That's how long this has been in the making for Africa to speak with one voice. Are you with me? So I was expecting for some serious fanfare because this is an amazing achievement. I went from one channel to the other to the other, nothing. So the following day I said to the commissioner, hey, where is the fanfare? Oh no, we are going to uh, Niger. So we're going to launch it in July. So the fanfare is going to be over there. I said, wonderful. So Niger came. This time I'm in Niger. They launched, it was a beautiful event. And again, that night, I started flipping through channels. I'm looking for the fanfare. I'm looking for the panel discussions. I'm looking about everybody getting excited and feeling warm and fuzzy about what is going on. Nothing. Why is that? Why can't we make our own noise about something so monumental? The average African is not even aware of it. And understanding what is it about this CFTA, what does it mean to me? Last year alone, we had over 350 applications for embassies. Why? Because the rest of the world is strategizing on how to take advantage of a giant, sleeping giant that is rising, that is your Africa. But you know who is not strategizing? Are the owners the inheritors of this amazing continent, we are still sleeping like grasshoppers to follow the words of President Museveni. I'm here to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that we are sitting on a gold mine. The African heads of states are saying, you don't go to China and find black people in front of the line. You don't go to India and find black people in front of the line. To Europe, anywhere else in the world, why must you go to Africa and find non-Africans in front of the line? So my message, is, my message is very clear. My instructions are very clear. They said, Ambassador, whatever you do, you must bring the children of Africa home. They must take the front row. They must be on the driver's seat for everything African. It is your Africa. You need to come onto the table because the reality is, my brothers and sisters, we are now talking about strategic planning for Africa's development. Not Somalia, not Nigeria, but Africa, the continent. So the highway from Cape Town to Cairo is going to be built. The question is, who is going to build it? 
Will you be on the table to build the Cape to Cairo Highway? Will you be on the table to build the East to West African High Speed Railway? Will you be on the table to stop the insanity that says for goods to go from Kenya to Central Africa Republic, they have to go from Kenya all the way down to Cape Town, all the way up the East Coast, on to Cameroon, only to be ferried into Central Africa. Will you be the owner of that shipping line? 95% of Africa's trade is through maritime, and not a single vessel is owned by a black person. And intra-Africa trade is getting ready to quadruple. Are you going to keep dishing all that money out? Egypt, for example, is giving $7 billion to Ohio for wheat. Let that sink in. The wheat for the bread that the Egyptians consume is grown in Ohio. Out of Africa, the continent with over 65% of the arable land in the world is importing food. That's just Egypt. Many other countries are doing the same. Rice, same thing. Chicken, same thing. Maize, same thing. You are talking insanity of the highest order. The reason we have not been able to trade with each other is because of the Berlin Conference. Now, that is a thing of the past. I'm here to say, my brothers and sisters, the sleeping giant has risen. I was sent here to organize the diaspora so you can come home and take what is rightfully yours. And Mother Africa is calling. I have no doubt that you will answer the call. I thank you.